Hi, welcome to Indie ETV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Dr. Colin Perry, and I will put a link in the description for his past interview two years ago. It goes in detail about his near-death experience. But today, we're going to have a conversation, and we have a lot in common because we both saw Jesus in our Indies. So, hi, Colin. Hi, how are you, Peggy? Good. So, yeah, I was just re-listening to your interview from before, and I had mentioned then the similarities that we had both. That's a strange thing for a person to say, mm. that we were in heaven and we had, we saw Jesus. So, you know. What a great thing to have in common. It's yeah, wonderful. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. And a surprising number of people, like it's not just you and me, it's Quite a lot of people have been having this experience. Uh, I don't know whether it's a sign of the times or if it's always been happening, but, but there seems to be a lot more publicity about it now. And books being written, you know, podcasts and, and websites and things coming up on social media that a lot of people have had MDEs and a lot of people have met with Jesus, which is just wonderful. Is it popular in Australia? It is becoming more so. Um, it's always intrigued people here, I think, but there's there's still a, a little bit of, um, I guess you'd call it reticence to to believe it too much, I think, in Australia, but that's gradually fading away. There's always that conflict between science and, and matters of faith, I guess you'd call it. Uh, and uh, I think people are starting to realise that the scientific view just doesn't offer what we need that doesn't account for so many different things, particularly this strong, strong evidence from MBEs that's coming through and people are beginning to realise, yeah, well, science can't account for that. It, it cannot explain it. it. It just breaks outside of the scientific box, which is great. The scepticism is good because we need to keep that common sense about us, use our good judgment, because not everything we hear is true. Not every in the ear is truthful. I mean, it's just a, a fact of life. And so we do have to be skeptic, all of us. You know, even I don't believe everything I hear, and I hope I never do. But, you know, I hope I never get so hard that I don't believe anything either. We have to keep that balance. But then yeah, the science. Yeah, it's very true. And, and social media is so full of, dare I say, rubbish. Uh, it, it's so full of things that are just inaccurate and things that people are just claiming as truth, which just simply are not, uh, and, and claiming all sorts of evidence for these things. And the evidence, when you look into it, is, is very dodgy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I think we're wise to be discerning with what we do believe. Um, but... A lot of these MDEs, when you look at them, you can sense the ring of truth in them. And, and that's, I think, a lot to do with what we've really got to look for, is that inner discernment of whether whether we can really feel the ring of truth inside what's being said. And, uh, often it's it's a heart thing. You, you, can, you can tell with your heart whether someone's really speaking the truth or not. And uh, I think that's a great way to know and to judge uh, what's what's going on behind the scenes. And I think that skepticism begins with ourself. You know, I had this experience. How can it be true? Well, I know it was true, but how can it be true when, you know, back then we didn't have the answers. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have other people to talk to or hear their stories. And it was, you know, because what happened to me, I thought I was the only one it ever happened to. Never heard of such a thing. I must say I had heard of it. Um... It's been going on for quite a while, but but always suppressed. I mean, by the media, if it was ever spoken about, it was talked about like, oh, you know, these people are fruit loops. They um, they're crazy. They're not serious. We can't take these things serious. Seriously, it's just hallucinations. It's it's the brain decaying because of lack of oxygen. It's it. all these explanations come in where they basically put it down and try to put a lid on it very quickly. Um, but look, the truth will come out over time and the more and more people speak out about this, people have had these experiences and people begin to realise, well, these are normal people. These are not lunatics. This is something we really should be listening to. Um, and even now, 
quite a number of doctors are, are changing their stance on this because of the experiences they've seen, what they've witnessed with people who've been able to come back from the dead or from deep comas and things like this and, and start talking to them about things that they just couldn't know in any other way, uh, things that have happened in other parts of hospitals that they just knew about because they were their spirit was in that room. Uh, and these sorts of things are starting to to really raise some interest, but there remains a, a very institutional scepticism amongst the medical profession and science that doesn't want to admit that this is the truth. And, and this, I think, is dangerous because I think science and, and medicine are actually holding themselves back by this because there's so much more to learn. There's so much incredible depth and truth that, that they're just slamming the door on which is ironic because science prides itself on, you know, always testing, always being open to new things, always testing them for the, for the merits of whether they're actually empirically true. But in this case, they don't want to look at it. They just close their eyes to it. And that really interests me in that why, why would they take that approach with this when there is substantial evidence that can't be explained in any other way, and yet they don't want to admit it's there. They can't realize it's not in the brain. This is happening in our soul. We're mm. out of our bodies. We're not using our brain. This is our soul. And when we come back, that memory is in our soul. And I think that's why it never fades. That's why it's so detailed. So that's true. So true. Yes, yes. It's a different sort of memory. Uh, this is one thing I've, I've come to realize about it. It's more like, you may have had dreams in your life that you've just remembered very vividly, and it's a bit a bit more like that sort of memory than it is what happened yesterday or what happened when I went down the street. Uh, it, it's it's a, a deeper, more profound memory, I guess I would call it. It's it's really etched into your soul, as you say, and uh, I'll, I'll never forget the thing the things that occurred to me when I was with the Lord. It was so uh, it was so deep and profound that I that I just it's a part of me now, and I can't ever tear myself away from that because when, you, when you've once experienced that, as you know, Peggy, when you've once experienced that, it is absolutely a part of you from that day forward. And um, you, you would have to really deny yourself to deny that. And unfortunately, a lot of people have in the past because of the social pressures and peer pressure mm -hmm. and, and things like that that really do encourage them to to deny it and say, no, 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 it didn't happen. I must have just been imagining things. You know, it's a lot easier for people to say that. But uh, I think there's a lot more courageous people there who are saying, no, I know what happened. I know this is real. Uh, nothing can stop me from speaking out about this. And I'm, I'm certainly one of those people. I'm, and so are you, yeah. And it's so sad that so many churches think this is the devil were false prophets or like some demon possessed us to think that we had this experience or that we're just fakes or something. That's so sad because, you know, I think they're preaching Jesus every Sunday in heaven. And the whole point is these people want to go to heaven. But when someone says, I was there, this is what I saw. Oh, no, you didn't. Like, if you would just listen, you could hear what it's like, what it was like for me when I went, what it was like for you when you went, and these other people. Yeah. It's like miracles didn't yeah. stop when the Bible was done being written, you know? It's like miracles I'm, still I'm a very, Yeah, I'm a very dedicated Christian. I, I attend church. I do, and I, I absolutely believe in the fact that we should attend church. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of pastors, leaders in the church who think they know it all, and quite frankly, they don't, and they're making wrong judgments. I mean, the same thing happened to Jesus himself and the disciples. They accused him of being demonic or demon-possessed, even when he was working miracles and incredible things were happening. And I would say in some ways this is, this is a modern-day equivalent, that these are miracles. These are people who have come back from the dead just like Lazarus did, um, not quite to the same miraculous extent, but returned from the dead with a story to tell about what's happened to them. Um, why they would think that was demon 
inspired when when we're talking about meeting with Jesus and angels and the beautiful loving environment that we, we found ourselves in. That's certainly not reminiscent of anything I know about demons. But um, maybe it's just they have their minds so set in a particular way of thinking that they just can't break out of that particular limitation, which reminds me very much of the way the Pharisees were at the time of Jesus. It's just like we have our way of doing things. How dare you challenge it? But uh, this is a very healthy challenge to the church. This is a really good challenge to the church. Yes, what you believe is actually real. It's not just words on a page. It's reality. It's what you're going to face when your heart stops beating and you die. So it's a really good suggestion to listen to those who've uh, who've been there and come back again to tell what you can expect. Because there are some really good warnings there from people like you and I, warnings and, and encouragement and uh, blessings to be had from this that, uh, that they're missing out on, unfortunately. Yeah, like if... A person walked into a police station and said, uh, somebody just tried to run me over their car, or I was just robbed, or I was just raped, or I just saw somebody rob a store. And the officer said, no, you didn't. You dreamt it. You're crazy. Get out of here. Or you walked into a hospital and told the nurse and doctors, uh, you know, this just happened and that, and I feeling his chest pain or whatever the thing was. Oh, no, you're not. Get out of here. Because that's the same way we're being treated by the ministers, the priests, and the scientists is they yep. hear the testimony, they hear this person's account, and they dismiss them and, like, go away. You're nuts. That's just, that's the same thing, you know? They're not taking us as, like, like everybody is. And sure, there's going to be people that come in and lie. There's going to be crazy people. But, you know, millions of people across the world having these experiences, we all can't be lying. We all can't be crazy. And I think if, say, with a cop example, and then the, the nurse and doctor example, if these scientists, ministers would just sit people down and when they, when they say they have it, indeed, instead of dismissing, rolling their eyes, say, OK, sit down here. You tell me and I'm going to interrogate you. I'm going to ask questions. I'm going to follow up. I'm going to do, you know, before I make up my mind instead of just dismissing. Yeah. But I mean, look, look, it, the evidence in itself should be enough to tell them that. In my own experience, I, I was told things that were going to happen to me after I returned, after that experience in my life. And they did. They actually came about. Uh, how can that work? Is that a hallucination? Not, not possible. Not possible, according to the scientific theories. The, the stories I've read about and heard of, of people who were um, able to tell the doctors when they were revived, tell them what happened in conversation with four doors down the corridor. That's not a hallucination. That cannot be a hallucination. Um, that there's all sorts of different things that happen. Uh, the people who've you know gone up through the roof and up to the up to the roof above, hovering above the hospital, and been able to tell them what objects are sitting on the roof of the hospital. I mean, that's not really something you can make up. That's not yeah. something you can fake. Uh, After so surely, yeah, surely that level of evidence, which is really out there, quite common, um, should be at least looked at and considered and taken seriously. Yeah. After my second ND at 25, I suddenly recalled the drowning at five. And I, it like took me over. The memory is so strong. And so I went the next day and asked mom, did I drown when I was little? And how did you find me? Because I didn't see the rescue. You know, I saw him from above the pond. Looked at, I could tell you where my mom and sister was sitting in the bed sheet because they weren't down at the pond yet when I drowned and where my brother was at. And, but I didn't see me being rescued because I was off flying and doing stuff. And my mom was like, how do you remember that? And she had tried to keep that a secret because I was their youngest of five kids and their firstborn, which would have been the sixth. Sick, their first kid, which I was actually sick. I was the sixth, but he died at nine months old. And she said, my dad's family blamed her for neglect. And so this would be another neglect that I had drowned. So she didn't want anybody to know that I about drowned in that pond. And, you know, my brothers carried my dead body back to the house and I woke up choking. And so she didn't want anybody to know. So like, how would I know that? You know, I could tell you where they were sitting, what they were doing. And she's like, how did you remember that? 
And I says, but how did you find me? And so she had to explain, well, I noticed you were gone. I had my, she had my brother keep going down until he found me. But, and then the 25 year old NDE ectopic pregnancy, like it saved my life because I come back into the wheelchair after being in heaven. I knew I was just, a, I was just dead in heaven trying to accept it because I told it was my time. And so I couldn't tell the doctor in 1986. So I just said, I'm not going to, you know, he wouldn't, I wouldn't let him discharge me. So I'm not going home because I knew my boys would find me dead in the morning. I wasn't going to have it. I'll die right here and then call my husband. And so, you know, that saved my life. If I hadn't had that NDE when the doctor said, Peggy, it's not ectopic pregnancy. Why do you keep saying that? You know, I did ultrasound earlier in his office, like week prior. And he says, both babies are in the uterus. And he's looked at me like, what's wrong with you? And I said, I'm not going home. That's all I could say. So he said, well, make you feel better. You spend the night. So the next morning you come in to another ultrasound. That's what he's seen. It's big old, biggest old pregnancy I ever saw. You know, So how did I know? So 30 years after that happened, I was in his office, which was about six years ago. And I, and I had my husband with me. I said, go with me because for my appointment, because I want, I want to tell him this time. So after my exam, I said, I wanted to tell you something for 30 years. And he says, well, you better tell me then. Cause I, he'd say my doctor all this time. And so I gave him the brief version and he says, in all my years of practice, I have come to believe exactly what you're telling me. And the nurse is all he does too. So I was so, it felt so good walking out of there, like this big weight, just, I needed to tell him. And I was, I was too embarrassed. Like he's going like right down crazy in my report or something, you know, big stamp nuts <laughs> right there in my file. I'd stay forever. Yeah, I, I just hope, I'm hoping that somebody high up in, in the medical world will watch this and, and hear what you're saying and hear what I'm saying because it is the institutional um, traditions that are that are really holding this down and, as I said before, robbing, robbing the medical world of an, an amazing opportunity to branch into a whole new field, which is effectively about, higher dimensions i mean this is this is massive uh for the world to understand and to just put the lid on it's a bit like the way the church treated galileo in, in, you know in the middle ages saying no no the earth is right. the center of the universe uh, it, it's just a mindset they just can't let go of uh, I, I think if if anyone in in high up in the medical world is watching i, I think it is incredibly important that number one you should start talking to all the doctors, the, the people on the ground with hands on who actually yes. nurses seeing these people, yeah, who come back, who come back from the dead with stories to tell and seeing what what they what happens to them and what they say in the stories they have to tell and analyze it. Sure, by all means, analyze it scientifically. Look at if there's any possible way these people could know these things. And and if the answer is no, there is no possible way, well, You've got to look at what it really is and understand, yes, there is a heavenly realm or a higher dimension that these people are going to. There is a spirit that is within us. Um, it, it is a soul. You know, it, it is the true I that lives within us that, uh, that is in existence. When I, when I first died, I was just floating around and one of the first things I noticed was, not only the quietness around me, but the quietness within me. And I, and I realized I'm not hearing my brain. <laughs> I'm not hearing my brain chattering away and, and cross-examining and saying, what if, maybe, why, this, that, all these little thoughts that run around inside your head, they are your brain. That's what's going on. But the sense of me, I, who I am at my core, that remained. And, and I could think more clearly than I've ever thought in my life. And I could feel and understand and know things more completely in that state than I ever could in a human body inside my brain. So I really do now understand that difference between the soul and the mind and how those two things work. Uh, and, and that's a, a, an intriguing area for medical science, surely, to understand there is something within us that is that soul, that spirit of life that is not just chemicals running around inside our brains. 
And uh, that, that's a massive understanding to have. And if the world can come to accept that fact, it's, it's a massive turning point even in human history to know that that is the case, recognise that is the case and look into it, investigate it, start to understand it more. I think it would be as important as discovering penicillin because oh, more. this more. could save lives. If they had a yeah. question at triage, when you go to the emergency room, just add one question. Have you had a spiritual or out-of-body experience recently? Just one question because there's so many of my guests that have said, I was over top the emergency squad when it was headed to the hospital. I uh, woke up, was admitted to the hospital, and I was dying. And you know, before they coded or what during their code, that you know, there's indications that if they could tell people, hey, when they come back, hey, I just had this experience, and so the nurses could go run and get the doctor and say, hey, they just had an NDE. Let's recheck all the tests and see if we're missing something. Or we're getting ready to discharge them. And they just said they had this experience. Let's recheck everything. Because it's an indicator of impending death. Absolutely it is. Yes. Must agree with you there. It really is. Uh, as, to the, as to the importance of this pain, you're right, it's probably far more important than penicillin. This is, this is one of the most important things in human history. Uh, to to recognise this and to understand this, if mm -hmm. if we are in talking in scientific terms, if we are dealing with multiple layers of dimensions in, in the universe, then um, this is something that the scientists are trying to discover with their CERN particle colliders and etc. Using the highest forms of science to investigate, but it's staring them in the face. It, it's happening around them all the time. Uh, people are receptors of these higher dimensions, and we dismiss it as imagination, dreams, visions. Well, as in the older days, we used to call it prophecies and things like that, where, where people actually have received all sorts of information from higher sources. Included in that, of course, is the existence of angelic beings. And let's not even start counting the number of people who've had um, not only dreams and visions, but actual encounters with angelic beings who have entered into their rooms and communicated with them. Uh, of course, people are not um, even less willing to speak about that sort of thing than they are to speak about NDEs, but it is quite common. I know a lot of people personally who've experienced angels in their life and uh, that's that's a very powerful thing to consider that we are being visited by beings from a higher dimension to put it in earthly terms uh, and, and i would love to see that not treated like as we say the, the lunatic fringe but okay this this is an area that needs to be investigated this is something that needs to be looked into uh, and it is very 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 powerful Having been with them, I don't know your story if you actually met with angels, but I, I did, yeah. and they are such incredibly wise uh, beings and such incredibly loving beings. They made me feel like a little infant in terms of, of my capacity. I, I'm just in awe of who they are and, and uh, how powerful and how good and uh, their capacity is, is just enormous. And for us to just deny their existence, it's very sad. It's very sad because they obviously just have so much to offer us if we just open up to um, communicating with the heavenly realm. That's, uh, that's something I'd just love to see more of. And I'd yep. love to see the church be a bit more open about the ways in which it happens. I'm thinking of, you know, Say a kid likes to paint. Well, they can go to classes, learn to paint, or like to sing. Learn, go to classes all the way up, you know, through college years. Learn to sing better and better. Why not your spiritual self? Why not have classes from a young age? The kids that are interested in it, that have a tendency to be gifted in it, to help yeah. foster that instead of being told you're crazy. Don't talk about that. Don't tell anybody about that. Instead of having it pushed down, because that is such a good instinct to have that extra sixth sense that tells us don't go there uh watch out for that hurry go help this person we have these angels talking to us all the time and we dumb them out 
because we don't understand it. And this could be taught. I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm actually a member of the uh, the School of Faith, which is uh, teaching the, the Bethel uh, School of Supernatural Ministry curriculum. And, and that is exactly what we do. We're teaching people how to listen, how to see in the spirit, how to understand what's coming to us from the heavenly, what God is trying to tell us, what the angels are communicating to us. And, and it is something that with, with practice can be developed. Uh, I, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm absolutely a master at it or anything like it, but with the experience I've been through, I, I'm very aware that, as you say, uh, the angels are talking to us a lot and we just don't recognise it for what it is. We think it's just um, our, our instincts or um, supernatural things happening to us, which it is. But uh, we need to understand, no, this is actually something from a higher plane telling us, warning us, guiding us, leading us in our lives. And, and what a wonderful thing to have, what an amazing thing to have available to us if we just recognise it. As Jesus said, you who have eyes to see, see. You who have ears to hear, hear. Uh, that's the sort of thing I think he was really driving at there uh, while he was on earth, is to open your spiritual senses to what God is trying to do for you. And I think it has something to do with having integrity, knowing yourself, trusting yourself. You know, first you got to know that you're not a flighty person that believes things that aren't real, that sees things that aren't there. I think you first have to, be grounded to be open to these things. Cause I just, I know people that just, Oh, here's another feather. Oh, this is from that. Oh, I just seen a ghost or, Oh, there's Jesus in the clouds. And, you know, it's just constant. Like they've got to one up everybody they've always got. And, and, and so it's a, it's a hard line and it's going to be, hard. but I don't know. It's just like, there's gotta be a way. Yeah, look, look, I, I am reticent to to be too hard on those people. Um, often I think maybe they are the most receptive of us because I think we, we've got to keep in mind God acts through every level of existence. Um, it, it's quite within the abilities of God and the angels to have a feather drop down and land in your lap. Yes, it is. And to give that to you as a little yes. sign that they are with you. But not every day Absolutely. of the week. <laughs> no, no. Well, you know, maybe in some cases, but, uh, but yeah, no. I, I get what you're saying, but um, it is it is good to be open to the fact that God works in a variety of different ways and does give people signs and indications and and ways of helping them in their lives to to take directions. There's a there's a beautiful verse. I forget exactly where it is. I think it's in Isaiah. And I think it, it says. Um, it's talking, it's prophetically talking about um, later times and says, um, you will hear a voice telling you, turn to the left or turn to the right. Mm -hmm. And that really stuck with me, that verse. I thought that's very much what God is doing for us. It's just giving us little insights on which way to go, what choices to make, how to live our lives. And, and um, he's just guiding us like a shepherd, like he says, the good shepherd, just guiding us here and there to protect us, to help us to grow, to advance us, uh, a lot of different reasons. But I think we're, we're very wise to listen and accept those little voices that we might hear within that we just take as little promptings to, to push us in particular directions or make us make particular decisions. What we call conscience is a very powerful thing. I believe that's like the voice of God within us. We have an innate knowing of what's right and what's wrong, of what we should and shouldn't do. And we need to learn to listen to that a lot more than we do, I believe. I wish I could remember. Somebody told me a while back that they are doing studies with people in that was in a coma, and they're mm -hmm. finding out a lot about this kind of thing through that that these people are see, kind of like NDE are seeing things, experiencing things. And they're, they're actually starting to do studies like medical doctors doing studies on this 
because to find out, you know, if there's a way of bringing out people out of a coma or, and so, you know, at least, you know, go from that angle then, you know, mm. we're going to get I there. I have personal, amazing personal experience of that. It's, it's pretty tragic. My daughter was hit by a car when she was seven and had very severe pain. And she was in a comatose state for something approaching three months, uh, a long time, not moving, hardly moving an eyelid. Um, and then she gradually started to recover and come back in and we, we understood that um, she her brain had just been so badly damaged she was unable to move there for a long time. But um, years later, after I'd had my ND, and I, I sat, she was unable to be hurt verbally. She was very alert mentally, but she had brain stem damage and she couldn't move very much, couldn't speak clearly. So uh, I was able to tell her about my NDE and, and what I'd experienced, and she became very, very excited. And she started pointing at herself like she could oh. use one hand really well. She started pointing at herself quite a lot. And I said, what are you telling me, Rebecca? Are you saying that you've experienced something like this? And she pointed up, yes, that was her yes sign. Yes, yes, oh. yes. And she just kept on doing it. And I realised she'd been with the Lord. She'd been in a similar situation. I mean, I don't know the details because she couldn't spell it out to me. But that was a long time she was unconscious. And she was basically telling me she was in a heavenly state for that period of time, which to me was, was beautiful because she passed away about a year after that. And, and I was able to just sit there as she was dying and just say, Beck, you know exactly where you're going. You know exactly what, what you're headed for. And I could see the look on her face. She just became so relaxed and, and I, I could tell she was quite happy if you can be in that state. And, uh, and she passed away peaceably. And, um, yeah, that to me was just a confirmation of what you're saying, that people in comas, we don't know where they are. They're not in their bodies, but they're elsewhere. They are definitely elsewhere. It's interesting. Yeah, I just wish that they would start this huge university just to study these experiences and study them scientifically, not like some places that is like, I don't want to say, but it seems, you know, the reincarnation studies, I don't care, um, some levitation or I don't know, just things that I just don't care, you know, but just study what basically our psychic abilities, what are we able to do? that we're keeping ourselves from learning about. And when I got really excited about this is um, when I realized years later, after my in, my second NDE, that, because um, the week before that NDE, there's incident here where my older son yelled, Mom, Jeremy, you knew something was wrong with my other son, Jeremy. And suddenly I had this knowing it was like I was kind of like levitating over the field. Like I was out of my body. I was in this place of knowing that let me know, oh, oh, the the we've had a lot of melting snow and rain. And the creek has always been just ankle deep is high now. And he's fell in and he is trying to swim. And so all of a sudden, instead of praying to God, please, you know, make my baby be okay. All of a sudden, I started praying, Jeremy, stand up. It's not that deep. Calm down. Walk out of there. And he walks towards me. He, and then I found out when he said, mom, was you worried about me? Like, yeah. And so what well, was it laughing? But, you know, I cried and hugged him. But so 15 years later, he was 20. I told that story for the first time. And he walked out of the kitchen. And it's like, mom, I heard you praying. He says, that's what it was. I panicked. I was trying to swim. And he says, I heard you say, Jeremy, stand up. It's not that deep. Walk out of there. Come down. And everybody in the room, we heard us, we're like in shock. So we haven't talked much about it. But here lately, I said, you know, Jeremy, what what do you remember? Like we never really talked about the details or what happened. And he said he was like a drone. <clears throat> he hovered over like a drone. And he could see me down below. He knew I was praying. And so there he was. And, you know, he heard me praying. And he's above. And he's seen me praying. 
And, and so when I heard after he was 20 and I found out he heard me praying, that just was so shocking. So years later, I started understanding about mine was called NDE and this is after effects and, and starting to look more into things. I was like, wait a minute, if I can save my son through prayer, I want everybody to learn how to do this. Is this a mm -hmm. skill we can learn? Is Does prayer that deep and that strong, Does it can it really create a miracle like that? How does this work? All these questions was so powerful in me. And it was like my driving force after that to get some answers. I haven't got that many, <laughs> but it's like, if I, because I keep thinking, okay, what if I know somebody and their child's missing? What do we have at our uh, disposal to find this missing child? Well, if we knew this psychic ability stuff better and knew how it worked, knew how to tap into that realm, you know, whether it's a deep prayer or what that is, then we need to learn how to do it because we may really need it someday. That's just, where my heart's at. Yeah, very, very true. Um, like that, there's such a, um, a negativity about such experiences, but you've just given more evidence, empirical, scientific evidence that it has to be true. Uh, if he heard you back then, there's no way known. He heard you physically. So mm -hmm. how can we deny this? How can we deny it and say it's it's not it's not in existence? Yeah. So true. And look, everybody who has MDEs, really, they experience incredible things. Uh, and one of the most common factors is that they experience God in one form or another, in that sometimes they experience God as a big sphere of light coming towards them and talking to them and communicating with them and always, without exception, filling them with love. That is, that is the real factor that comes through again and again. And I just think of those Bible verses that say, uh, you know, God is love. God is love. And he actually does just emanate love and light out to the universe and to us. And uh, the, these are the sort of factors that are, that are very important to, to recognize because, you know, if there's a God, which I know there is, but you know there is, if there's a God, it is such an important thing for us to understand this as, as the human race because we are not alone. And I'm not talking little green men. We are not alone. We have a God. We have angels. And the role of Jesus in this is incredibly important because he was he was God made human. He was, he was God made into a human form, and he still has that form. I met with him, and he still has that human form. And he understands us and he knows us and he actually can be of great help to us, even more so than the angels, because he's been in a human body, because he's experienced all of this. And God chose to come down from this higher dimension that he's in and enter into humanity so that he could really truly firsthand experience who we are and what we are and the sort of difficulties that we go through. And, and I think that is such an important realisation. Um, in, in my experience, he actually joined with me. He actually healed me and I actually felt his awareness, which was a, an experience I can never forget because it was so huge and universal. Uh, so, you know, my, my advice to anybody listening is, number one, get to know Jesus, really. And I'm not just saying this from a, a conservative Christian church-going point of view. Uh, forget that for a minute. This is someone I've met. Mm -hmm. This is somebody I've experienced. And I'm telling you, this being is incredible and amazing. Uh, and don't let the sort of biases and prejudices against Jesus or Christianity that have come from the church, don't let that stand in your way. He's way above the sort of limitations that conservative churches try to put on him. Um, Jesus is real. Jesus is, you know, or has been human. He's now well beyond that. But uh, he knows what it's like to be us and he can communicate with us and he does communicate with us. So I would just encourage everyone, get to know this Jesus guy. Seriously, I, I think you're going to need this when you eventually pass over. You're really going to need this sort of knowledge. Don't underestimate how important it is that when you die, 
you need to have this understanding. Yeah, for me, it meant I just called out to him for help. And you know what? He came and he got me. He literally came and he grabbed me and lifted me up. Uh, that's because I knew who he was and I called out to him. That's exactly why that happened. So my advice to everyone, please, my, my witness to everyone is this is real. Don't just call it religion and push it aside. Take the religion tag right off it and start talking to the guy himself. And, and uh, that is by no means something imagine, imaginary or, or lunatic. It's incredibly real once you start to understand it and start to do it. And, you know, 25, when I covered the NDE, I, I couldn't understand because it was nothing I was ever taught in church. You no. know, I went to several Christian religions before I married a Catholic at 18, you know, become Catholic. And so never did I hear that, you know, a tunnel, a white light that I was always taught that when you die, like you stay in your grave until the end of the world and everybody goes up at the same time. That's what I thought happened. Hmm. And then here oh, I, I suspect am that might there. be what happens to our physical bodies. I suspect so, I know. but um, I, I don't know enough to, be, to give the definitive answer on that. But oh, look, there's a lot of evidence in the Bible for for what we're talking about. Um, the yeah. Apostle Paul wrote an amazing thing. He said, um, "I once knew a man, which I think was his code for I'm not going to boast about the fact that this happened to myself." He said, "I once knew a man who who went to the third heaven and heard things that could not be spoken, and came back again." He said, "I won't boast of such a man." He was talking about himself. Uh, and if you read his life experience, he was actually stoned. They threw stones at him and he was carried away as if dead and then revived. So I am 100% confident that Paul experienced a similar thing to what we've experienced, or if not much greater, being who he was. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of evidence in, in Christianity, in the Bible, when you go in and actually look at it. It's, uh, it's strong, it's strong, and it's entirely 100% consistent with what's in the Bible. And I think this all has to be coming out now where we have the internet, that we're able to share and connect information and um, about NDEs and things, that it has to be coming out now because everyone is so lost and afraid now. And it's like, how else do we combat yeah. these things? Particularly with when when there's war in the air. I mean, it, it does make people afraid, and with good reason. I, I mean, we, we forget that we still have these nuclear bomb facilities that are capable of destroying the entire Earth 100 times over or more. It's still sitting there. Um, this this nasty nasty possibility, that, and you know, as things like Putin and, and you know Iran and Israel and all these things start to get nasty, we begin to realise there is the potential for a horrendous event to take place in the near future. Um, I'm 100% confident, as a student of, of Bible prophecy, that this is what's heading our way, uh, and we need to be very much aware and trying uh, the best as we can through prayer, through our, through our voices and publicly to try and keep peace and make peace as much as possible in these situations because um, it's going to get nasty. It's going to get nasty. Uh, I say this because I've sort of seen glimpses of it um, when I was with the Lord and also in my own personal experiences, we've talked a lot about prophetic, you know, mm -hmm. seeing and hearing and knowing. And there is what the Bible calls a time of trouble such as never was. That's big. And we need to be aware that in, in, if these are the last days, that's the sort of scale of, of problem that we might be coming into. Uh, and I would just encourage people to be aware and be alert. And trust me, you need to get to know God. You need to get to understand your, your inner soul uh, we're, we're going to need that because that's who we truly are at our very core. 
And, and I would just encourage everyone to be open to all of this. And when things do turn bad, whether it's in the short-term future or the long-term future, you need to trust in God. You need to seek after God. He will be your strength. He will be your shield. He will help you through those circumstances. Yeah, that's true. Hmm. Yeah. There's so much push from the NDE community to remove religion from NDEs and to not say God and Jesus and to I see I saw I think three today on my Facebook people posting stuff about spirituality is and the, all these good things religion is and they say all these bad things there's so much comparing like you be spiritual not religious so they're saying don't go to church you know think the stuff we're thinking just sit here on your internet and learn how to meditate and whatever believe all these new age theories we do because that's somehow better religion. And I've talked to people about it and I said, you know, kids need religion. You know, all of us adults do, but the kids especially need religion. They need that foundation. So when they grow up, whether they go to church or not, they have that foundation. They have that strength and that guidance and, you know, God bless all the people that go to church because I am not against church whatsoever. Um, but I said, you know, we're looking at uh, adopting uh, our grandkids. And I said, we will start back to church because the kids need church. All of our kids grew up in church and it made them better people. You know, I grew up going to church. It made me better when I wasn't gone. I wasn't a better person at all. And, mm -hmm. you know. P marriages start failing kids start getting in trouble i mean it's just a fact of life people need yeah. guidance there's nothing good about denying god seriously there's nothing good about right. it. God, god is love uh, if if you start denying god effectively in your life you are denying love uh recognize god for who he is um and the fact that he just wants to love and help and give life and, and give out to humanity and the whole earth. He he has a deep, deep concern for humanity. Um, he's, he's demonstrated that through Jesus, you know. Um, the church messes it up, sure, sure, yeah, it does. The church has become a very humanistic institution that is controlled by human values instead of by, by godly values. Uh, and godly values aren't rules and regulations and conditions. That, that's not godly values. That's what the Pharisees were doing way back to Jesus. He went, no, this is about loving people, helping people, doing good for people. Mm -hmm. And so many in the areas meet God. I am talking so many. God is there for them. And they know it's God. They don't even have to be told. They, they come back saying, I just knew it was God. The, I, I just felt it was God in my heart and I could feel him talking to me and I could feel him loving me. And that's my experience. That's your experience. That's what we all come back trying to tell you. Uh, don't imagine that, that because the church has got some things wrong that you should lock God out of your life. Right. No, 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 no. That's a bad choice. God is good. God is absolutely God. God is the definition of good. He is what good is. So to lock him out, I think you are making a mighty big mistake if you do that. I've had several hardcore atheists that's had NDEs and they knew there was God afterwards. Mm. Mm. You know, and then some people come on and say, you know, I'm not a Christian and it wasn't God, it wasn't Jesus, it wasn't angels. But a voice said, it's not your time you know, to go back and her voice said this, voice said that. And I'm thinking, who did they think that was? Exactly. Who, who could be that intelligent, that knowing, to know you that intricately, to know your future and know you so well to what to say to you? or And who decides when it's our time? If so many are told it's not their time. In 86, like I said, I never heard of NDE. And I was told it was my time. The answer was no, I wasn't going back. And I, and I have only heard a couple others in 400 interviews I've done say that they were told that same thing. Because most people say, I was told it's not your time to go back to earth. 
And, you know, and and it was my time. It's like, that was it. I wanted to go back and raise my kids and I was told no. And so I think we're all given the experience we need to, because they know we're coming back. Um, And I think we're all given the experience that will help us when we do come back. Because that gave me gratitude that it was my time. I was dead in heaven and had to finally accept it. And then God sent me back. And so the gratitude that I got to raise my kids is humongous because mm -hmm. a lot of women die of ectopic pregnancy. Like you, a lot of people die of heart attacks, you know. The, Absolutely. I was, I was given the choice. I was actually told, you choose. Do you, do you want to go back or do you want to stay? And that was the hardest choice I had to make because it was so beautiful there. It was so wonderful there. And I had to balance up between this amazing, beautiful, eternal existence bathed in love and coming back to earth and, and living the rest of my life. And, and it was, like you say, it was parenting my children. It was my daughter that was in the wheelchair. It was my young kids. And thinking, I can't leave them. I can't leave them without a father. Uh, and that was a decision driven by love which is, you know, something God really respects. And so, yeah, he did He did give me another chance. But let me tell you, and this is something I talk about a lot in my book. Uh, let me just plug the book. I've written a book called Dying to Be Alive by C. Thomas Perry. It goes right through my whole experience and a lot about the things that okay. have happened afterwards. Um, but, yeah, the, the, the whole idea that death is something to be feared that death is something we should shy away from. That my experience has totally changed that for me. If you are good with God, if you are okay in your conscience and you you love God, death is a wonderful transition through into this higher existence that is so, so, so much better than what we have here. I can't really put into words how much better it is, how much more real, how much more meaningful, how much more beautiful, how much more loving. In everything, every aspect I can think of, being there was was way above being in my life here. So um, I think that is something we really need to think about. Um, what is it? I keep going back to the Apostle Paul. Death, where is your victory? Grave, where is your sting? You know, he said Grave, that. Yeah. Where is your where, where is your sting? Oh. <laughs> like bee sting, you know. Grave, oh. where is your sting? You, you can't hurt me. You oh. cannot hurt. That's it's actually a really beautiful quote in the book of First Corinthians, chapter fifteen, I think. And it's, that's um, it's beautiful that you got to comfort your daughter, you know, and not be afraid by using your NDE. Yeah. I did death my mother in law when she was passing. My husband's wife or my husband's mother. Um, it just I felt like I was walking her home. Yeah, and giving her hope because she was always. I don't know. Like she is a believer, but not real believer. And she'd heard my stories and she wasn't sure the last year of her life. She said, I will say this because she's a very serious woman. She was a nurse. I will say this. She says, your stories have never changed. And I think that's what got her believing is she knew not once did my story ever change. And she had read my book and she was starting to get it. And actually there was a spiritual moment a year before she died. She was in the hospital in Columbus and she, um, me and her, and I'm married to her son and um, her other son and her daughter was there and she was worried about surgery the next day. And so she asked her son, Jerry to say a prayer. He's all, oh, no mom, I can't. And I said, I will. And so we went over, we you know stood and held hands, and I said a prayer. And then we walked out, me and my husband went to the cafeteria. And just as we were walking out, her brother called. And I didn't think much of it. And um, so after she got home from the hospital, she said, I want to tell you something. She said, I can count the number of times my brothers come here to visit me on one hand. And they lived here 40 years. He came here and she said something happened on that phone call. He was driving and he had his buddy in the passenger seat. And all of a sudden when he was talking to her on the phone, which was right after that prayer, he said that whole inside of that car turned bright white. Wow. 
He said, I seen this stuff on TV. I thought it was just Hollywood. He had to pull over. And he said, he knew God was there. And he's not religious either. And he says, I don't know about any of that stuff, but I'm telling you something <clears throat> happened. And I reminded her, I said, you know, we just had that prayer when he called and we walked out. And so I don't know. I can't explain it either. And, you know, these few years went by and every now and then I says, so that happened? He says, yes, it did. Yeah, that happened. So, I mean, he's not really, like I say, much of a believer. He's not a BS kind of guy, but he says that happened. So. Amazing. That's great. I just love hearing stories like that. It's, it's wonderful. You just get more and more and more confirmation of how active God is in people's lives. And it, so often it's when things are really at their worst, when someone's dying or gravely ill or, or something like that, that's when God really shows up because that's when he's really needed and, and uh, he's well aware of that. So much in our lives that we panic about and carry on about, God's not worried about it. He knows, he knows what's happening. He knows what's coming up and what's going to happen to us. And he only tends to really, really show up when it's an emergency and he knows it's an emergency and he'll be there. It's fantastic. It's just amazing. I've had that happen in my life so many times and, and same with many people I know. God is I, good. I dismiss so many, you know, miracles, spiritual things and stuff in my life because that's just weird. I couldn't tell anybody. And then I realized years ago, God gave me my life back. I got to come raise my kids. And when I go die for good the next time, I just imagine standing before God and him saying, did you tell anybody about heaven, about me, about Jesus, about the angels? And would I stand there with my head ducked and said, no, I didn't want to look like a liar. I didn't want to look crazy. And I thought, I never want that moment. I want to be able to say, I told everybody, <laughs> you know, I shouted from the mountain. <laughs> you know. That's good. And that's why I'm here right now. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that's why you. we're here. Yeah, because I, I just really feel I just want to get the word out to as many people as possible about what's coming up for you and your relatives and the people you care for and um, to live your life in such a way that you feel good about God and that you love God. Um, how do you love God? Well, just look at the trees, look at the sky, look at everything around you, but most of all, look at the people around you and love them. If you love them, you'll love God. And uh, it's very important to keep that in your life. Uh, I think um, as your experience and mine, you know, our, our initial love for our family is very powerful, but we've got to extend that love out to everybody, uh, the whole human race. And when we can get to that point of actually loving people, just because they're people, just because they're little pieces of God, uh, that that's a really strong way to live, and a beautiful way to live. And I would encourage you to chase after that. I know after the tunnel and the moment I first got in the bright white light before I experienced anything, I was just looking around this white light. Of course, I didn't see me. I didn't have a physical body, but I was thinking, Wow, it's real. The whole God, Jesus, Bible thing, it's all real. And I just started talking to God as I'm praying right there in heaven. You know, it's like, God, you need to send some people back so they can know it's real because people don't know it and they're getting tired of reading the Bible and the Bible's getting old. I mean, I was 25. I was outspoken, right? <laughs> and I was like, but because, yeah, it's like maybe people would live differently if they knew it was real. And so sometimes I'm doing my podcast, I say sometimes I got to pinch myself that bringing indie ears on and we're talking about this and letting people know it's real, whether they believe mm -hmm. us, the scientists or the skeptics or the ministers and the priests, whoever, you know, whether they believe God's performing miracles right now. Mm -hmm. And just so people have some comfort so they can believe. And if their arrogance gets in the way, if whatever it is, it gets in the way. And I understand you can't believe everything coming down the pike. 
you know, you do have to keep your common sense, but ask questions. If you don't believe something, don't roll your eyes, look them in the eyes because you can't see eye to eye with someone. If you're looking down your nose at them and look them in the eye, ask them the hard questions, try to prove mm -hmm. them wrong, interrogate them, see what you find out, dig, dig to the truth. Maybe you'll go through nine and, well, that was a liar. That was a liar. I don't believe them, but that 10th one, maybe, yeah. you know, maybe it'll be what proves to you. I know um, Raymond Moody, he's been a skeptic all these decades. And he had said once, I watched him an interview, he said that Jeff Olson's story is what made him start believing. And I was like, that's what it took, you know, all those years. But now he still claims, I see him in interviews even now, and he'll say, I'm a skeptic. But then he'll explain what a skeptic is that, and but he is a believer of God. And, but it's just the way, you know, with his philosophy background, the way you describe a skeptic. Um, But yeah, this is, uh, this is real. That's all we mm. got to say. <laughs> and so I'll put the uh, link to dying to be alive in the description and i will put uh, your past interview from two years ago in there is really good uh, where you go in detail when you're indie i know everybody will love to hear it thank you so much baby it's wonderful uh -huh. all right i'll get this set out to you later today probably thank you